Good morning, and thanks for everybody who stayed. And thanks, of course, to the organizers for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity to present some results that I haven't presented so often. And what I would like to talk about today is uh, how to predict new phases, like new types of transition metal oxides compound using uh, ab initio methods. So what is the main idea of the talk? So we have heard a lot of talks during this workshop, which were focusing on transition metal oxides or on heavy transition metal oxides, like uh, Warren was calling them. And we have seen that basically, I mean, these materials are extremely interesting because there are a lot of functionalities. And normally, when in this field, Wall speaks about predicting new materials, it means usually taking a material that already exists and do something small to it, like applying pressure or doping or something else, because we know that there is this extreme sensitivity to material parameters. So it's, I mean, what makes them extremely fascinating is the fact that you can make small material change, uh, small parameter changes and really have different functionalities. What I want to do today is something a bit different. I mean, what I'm trying to propose is to use some other class of methods where you actually make big changes to your system and you try to predict what happens if you change your crystal structure or if you change your external condition in a much more uh, dramatic way. So the question is, can ab initio calculations can be used to predict these new materials even in this extremely complicated field or to guide experiment somehow. So this is more or less the outline of my talk. I would start by explaining what I mean by ab initio prediction and then present basically two examples of what we did. The first part is a work on bismutates. This is a, a typical application of, let's say, material prediction methods where we try to uh, look at the high pressure behavior of the bismutates, which was unknown and I think we came out with some nice results there. And then another thing which we are doing actually, which is a bigger project, is to look at iridates and use, I mean, do some sort of hunting in, in the large phase diagram of some iridates. So let's start from uh, ab initio material prediction. This is actually from the last part of my talk. So this is, uh, let's say, an example of what we did for the iridate. So you can read here, this is sodium, iridium, oxygen. And what we are trying to do here is to predict on a computer what would happen if you take the system and you mix these three elements. And what we want to do is to look at which phases would form in this case. And here you have actually a few phases which are known from experiments, which are these green circles over here. But you see that we actually sampled and predicted many more compositions which were not uh, sampled by experiments. And here what you have to look at is that where the, where the thing is darker, it means that it's very, very likely that the compound will form. Where you see yellow points or red points, I mean the chances are much lower. Uh, so this kind of picture here is called a generalized Gibbs diagram. This is a, called also generalized convex hull construction. It's a kind of construction that people use to predict uh, which compositions, I mean, given a ternary system, which composition <laughs> will form. And as I said, this is called a generalized diagram because the simpler construction is actually the one that you can do for a binary system that I'm showing here. You take two elements and you try to think what would happen if you mix two elements. In this case, I'm mixing lithium and sulfur. And, okay, I am at zero pressure, so lithium and sulfur, when they react, they actually form this lithium to sulfur. How does the construction work? I mean, here, basically, you know from the experiments the, the crystal structure of the compounds that you want to form. You compute the, comp the formation enthalpy, and then you basically place your formation enthalpy on this diagram, and basically you construct the most convex curve which, con uh, which connects this point. This is called the convex hull. And the points which lie on this convex hull correspond to stable composition. So in this case, there is one stable composition, which is lithium 2S, and the other are not stable. I mean, 
something which is often done. I mean, the, these metals are often used at high pressure. So when you put pressure, when you put really high pressure, so here this is a 100 uh, GPA pressure, you see that, I mean, you had this original stable composition. Then you see that basically on your convex hull, you have many more phases that are appearing. What is the problem that you have in this case? I mean, when you apply pressure in this range, is that very often you don't know what to do with these phases here. So these phases are not known, and you don't know the crystal structure of this uh, particular composition. So in order to construct this kind of curve, you need to solve another problem, which is to determine the crystal structure that your compound will uh, acquire at this particular condition, so at this particular let's say, composition and then this particular pressure. How is this done? This is done by what is called basically crystal structure prediction. So the question that we have is how do we find the crystal structure of a material if we don't know anything about it except for the composition and the, let's say the pressure which we will form. What you have to do is to construct what is called the energy or if you are at higher pressure, the enthalpy landscape. So you basically take your compound, you imagine to put this compound with, with this chemical composition, all the possible uh, crystal structure that would form and compute your energy or your enthalpy for that particular structure. And then you construct something like this. I mean, this is a, just a picture, but you basically construct what is called a landscape for your, uh, for your system. And in this landscape, like let's say there are some global minima which correspond to the ground state of your system and you have maxima which correspond to uh, phases which will not form. And then you have a lot of metastable minima which correspond to phases that might form under some uh, external condition. So the problem with, I mean, constructing this thing is that this is a gigantic problem. So, I mean, if you put a few numbers for a typical system, you get you have to sample something like 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12, or even higher number of configurations. So this is not doable this way, but there are several methods to do this. And there is a review which explains how this is done. And this is now becoming quite customary in many cases. And this is the only slide on these systems that I have, but this is something which had a big impact, for example, on the research of superconductivity because it led to the identification of this uh, neural temperature superconductor, so this is SH3, so this is the, the structure which was actually found before experiments uh, were done, and then this, this is the second crystal structure of the TC which currently has the, uh, of the compound which currently has the TC record, which is lanthanum H10, where TC is 260K. So these methods are very, very important in a lot of fields, and they are not so commonly used in oxides, because mostly because oxides are complicated, and we know that basically even just predicting the, the ground state or describing the ground state is a problem. Uh, so here I'm, I'm going to present just one first application that we did. As I said, these are bismutates, and these are high pressure phases of bismutates. So this is a project that we started together with Cesare a few years ago when uh, he was in Vienna, I was in Graz. And Cesare was very much interested in the bismutates because the bismutates are, let's say, a traditional problem in superconductivity and in oxides. I mean, they have, a, in particular, a bas a barium bismut O3. Uh, I mean, when it's undoped, it's insulating. It's a sort of charge order is to later where you have uh, basically alternating breathing distortion of uh, bismut oxygen octahedra. And then what happens is that when you dope this insulator, you go, I mean, you have a phase transition and at some critical doping, you enter, you, you suppress basically this insulating state, you enter into a metallic state and this metallic state is superconducting with a TC up to 30 Kelvin. And simply to describe this phase diagram, it took almost 30, 20 years. So the, the, the first like DFT calculations were done in all this group, I think in the, at the end of the 80s. And what they showed is actually that this, uh, I mean, let's say this insulating state is uh, provoked by a tilting, uh, by a breathing of the octahedra. So LDA captures this uh, so-called CDW distortion, but the, the ground state is still insulating. So if you want to get, uh, it's still metallic. So if you want to uh, 
have an insulator, you have to help the distortion, so you, you have to include correlation in some form, either with LDA plus U or hybrids. And I think the first uh, complete description of this uh, transition was given by the group by Cesare in uh, 2009. So, and there they were using HSC, so basically, they, I mean, they were not using just EFT. And then the problem is when you are in this, uh, when you are out of the insulating state, you get into the superconducting state. How do you describe superconductivity there? So since Cesare had a good method to, to predict the insulating part, we wanted to see if there was a, a cleaner way to, to get into the superconducting state. The reason is that doping is complicated. I mean, you, you need large supercells. We didn't want to do it. So the idea was, why do why don't we apply pressure? Because pressure is known to basically suppress this sort of distortions in a lot of perovskites. So we started doing this, and in the beginning we were uh, just looking at possible distortions at weight to suppress it. It didn't work, so what we did was actually to compute completely, let's say from uh, using evolutionary algorithm, we were recomputing the phase diagram. This is Babio, so this is barium bismuth 3 You see, you start from the uh, low pressure regime, I mean, you have the correct sequence of transition, like experimentally the transition are known more or less until 25 GPA. And then when we were expecting that this, uh, let's say that this distortion would be suppressed and that we would recover some sort of more symmetric uh, perovskite phase, what we actually found were a lot of unexpected structures, which are shown here. So you see, I mean, you go from this uh, structure where you have breathing and tilting to some other structure where you also have breathing and tilting to some really strange structure which we call cluster, which is basically made by cluster of barium bismuth. And then you go to something very strange that we call the distorted structure. I mean, I don't know if you can see it here, but in this case, like here, you can still find this uh, perovskite of Caedra. This is definitely not the perovskite. So we call this distorted some phase which is so distorted from the perovskite that you cannot get basically continuously from the perovskite to this phase. So you is it similar to post perovskite structure? No, it's something complete. It's it's <coughs> almost amorphous. Post perovskite has become kind of layered. Uh, yeah, layer. I mean maybe this, but More this is a uh, cell, but part of corner cell part A shape. Yeah, so it could be. Okay. It's more, I mean, it's more irregular than this. I mean, this is the largest supercell we could afford, so it's possible that it's almost... There's no uh, symmetry left. It's, a, it's, it's almost a no symmetry left. Yeah, it's a P1, actually, yes. And if you look into this, so the, the interesting thing was that this structure, I mean, here you see basically the average number of nearest neighbors, so you remain in the perovskite structure here, and then if we compute, I mean, you see that it's distorted, so you see that the number of neighbors is not six anymore, it's very much increased. You have also here, you, you remain, I mean, you, you still have uh, alternating bismuth 5, bismuth 3, like you would have in the, in the perovskite structure, but the, the, the overall motive is very strange. And the thing is, we published this in 2017, and just after this, there was actually uh, a joint theoretical uh, computational work which actually confirmed, I mean, all of these are insulating, so you remain insulating up to 100 GPA, and they actually, there was a second paper which found exactly the same result, so this result is quite uh, consistent, let's say. And at that point, I mean, since we had barium, we decided to see, I mean, is this a general trend that you find in the, in the bismuth dates? Also there, like, Chaser had some data on calcium, strontium, and so on, but where he, he was assuming that he would retain the perovskite structure, and what we find is actually that this transition, let's say, from a perovskite-like structure, which is the blue uh, area, to some very distorted, so some very strange structure is robust all over the, let's say, I mean, if you, if you replace here, if you go for different alkaline earth, you still find this. And we decided at some point to look a bit more into that. So you see that basically when you go from, when you have this transition, the first thing that you see is that more or less your, char, your average char disproportionation remains constant. So this structure tend to retain this strong uh, char disproportionation. Then again, you see that you, I mean, you have a discontinuity in the number of neighbors, so you're really forming a different structure. 
And then the third thing which is interesting that you see is that if you compute the average bismuth oxygen distance, you see that this is increased in these uh, strain structures. So if you look a bit inside, what happens is that you, uh, I mean, we had this idea that you basically have these uh, bismuth oxygen bonds. You're trying to compress them, but they don't want to do it. So basically what you tend to do is to form a much more packed structure in which you can form more bonds so that the average length stays long. But if these are insulating, then they you, are can all about, you can speak about valence. What is the valence of difference? The valence of bismuth like, should uh, be bismuth 3, 5, but you see here, I mean, here we computed, um, here we are doing this butter charge analysis. So we, we computed actually the delta rho from the, let's say there is a, a more charge. Are different bismuths uh, equivalent or are they strongly inequivalent? No, no, they are strongly inequivalent. The charge is different. I mean, it's not the, the, the difference in charge, like five, three, the nominal difference would be two. What you find so if it's you... It's the same story, like bismuth three plus bismuth five. Yeah, yeah, right? it's the same thing, but I mean, yes, if you compute in different the FT. Distribution, but different distribution, but... Different distribution. So this tendency is so robust that you prefer to break the structure than to, than to, than to order, basically. I mean, to, to suppress this charge. Or, kind of equal mixture of three plus and five plus. It's a, yeah, yeah, it's crudely. They, they are alternating, but they are not alternating on a regular lattice anymore. They're just, yeah, that's, that's what they, I mean, that's what we think this thing comes from. And okay, and so this was. Question to this yeah. Part. Do you think that there's any ramification for superconductivity uh, in the here? Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know. You I'm, know, I mean, this is a long story of yeah. missing coupling strengths. Yeah. Uh, so then there was a channel at some point was speaking about enhanced electron from coupling if you take into account these local distortions. Any development on this? Mm, I, I don't think he has done much. I mean, I, I think the only thing that you can say here is that your tendency to yeah. Yeah, to this proportionation is really so. so zero pressure, yeah, yeah, yeah. It may have some local distortion that may enhance. Yeah. That, that, that he didn't. Uh, he didn't explore it. I think this is a strong indication that, that that could be an interesting way to look into some something interesting to look into. And um, okay, so very Did short. You try to look at transform bismuth Yeah, these are all. Which one? Oh, sorry. Which is which? So this is calcium, strontium, barium. So Second more or less same, yeah? More or less the same. And here, this is the phase diagram. So you go, yeah. So the transition is a bit lower pressure, calcium, strontium, barium. And in barium, you form this intermediate cluster phase, which we don't find in strontium. What is it? Calcium, B, What is it? I don't know about this one. Let's go. Ah, this one has been synthesized. Green, I mean, this one. Ah? Green. Green. Ah, this green one is a non -pero. So this is the... The crystal structure, I mean, the, the, let's say at zero pressure, you have some kind of trigonal crystals. So these, I don't think they have synthesized calcium, but they've synthesized the doped version of this. It's doped with it's uh, perot, sodium. Not perot, no. it's, an, it's not a regular perovskite. And we don't find a regular perovskite. We find a transition from a non-regular perovskite to a perovskite, then to this distorted. Here, the color code it's is exactly, exchanged. Exactly, okay. so yeah, I, I know this when I was preparing the talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> So yeah, so this is the perovskite. This is the this distorted stuff. But I think I mean the the trend is robust, and the fact that they they measure I mean somehow this insulating state and that people reproduce the results. I think it's quite true. And the second thing is uh, iridates. So as I said, we had a much bigger project on iridates. Where I mean the the fact was that I was visiting Max Planck, and they the way they said they do iridates is that they they just put Right. everything in and see what comes out, basically. And then I thought, okay, if we have first principle calculation, this is much easier to do than to do this in experiments. So the, the idea is that we, we can con do this sort of construction <laughs> and see, I mean, what we can find. And you see here, like, the green things are phases that are experimentally known. The white things are the ones that we predict to be stable. So you, you see there is quite a good agreement between the two, and there are a few extra phases which are not uh, predicted by experiments. So I mean, we, we have a lot of data also on this part, but the first part we were looking at is actually the, the simplest thing, so the iridium oxygen line. And what we found here is that, I mean, there is the ground state is this uh, is known, is an iridium O2 uh, rutile, which is shown here, which is insulating. But then something that we found is that 
when we did our searches, we repeatedly found a lot of very similar structures. And when you find this, it means that there is actually a very strongly metastable minimum nearby. And all these metastable structures were based on a, a, here, this is iridium, this is oxygen. So they were based on a, an iridium triangular lattice. So we decided to zoom in a bit more to refine the thing. And I mean, this is the, the ground state that we found is, the, is this phase here, which is a, called the a 1T phase, which is very common in uh, transition metal digalcogenides. And here we find that basically, I mean, the, the formation enthalpy of this particular phase is comparable to the formation enthalpy that you find in other 2D materials, and that this is a sort of van der Waals bound phase, so it should be easy actually to uh, exfoliate. Uh, we did a bit more, so we look at the magnetic structure, and uh, first of all, we look at the electronic structure, so you find that this is basically a weakly uh, or a weak mott insulator in the sense that you start from a non-magnetic calculation, you include spin orbit, you have a splitting here, but you're still, mag uh, you're still metallic, but if you include uh, an antiferromagnetic order, what you see is that including antiferromagnetic order, spin orbit, and you opens a small gap. So this is a, uh, I mean, and this has a magnetic moment of the order of 0.5. So this is a, a weakly insulating uh, state. And you also find, I mean, this is a particular magnetic configuration. You also find that there are several uh, magnetic configurations that are almost uh, degenerate. And in particular, there are two which are almost perfectly degenerate, which is this 120 nail state and this in-plane stripe state. So this is basically a new phase, I mean, which has interesting magnetic properties. It has a triangular lattice. And I think it's very likely that it could be synthesized. And I was talking yesterday to, to Rosé at dinner, and she told me that she, she had a, a paper with the people in Oxford where actually they did find some layer iridates, although this is, a, uh, this is doped with potassium and another thing is not doped with anything. But I think, I mean, this is another indication that this uh, most likely would exist. Okay. And I, I will skip this part. This part is just to show that actually there are many more things that, many more games that you can play with your structures to, to find interesting geometries and interesting physics. And I go to the summary because it's late. And so this is the summary of my talk and these are the references if you're interested. And this is just the people that work with me on this project. And thanks a lot to everybody. So I have a question on your gizmo phase. When yeah. once you have done all, all this genetic algorithm and you, you have to go through the DFT and your search, which is the functional that you usually use? You use for the for the search, we use GGA for the final. So when I say it has a gap, uh, this is all done in HSC. But to do the, the full search with HSC Just would GGA. be yeah. I mean, but then we recomputed basically the, the energy differences and everything which is with HSC to make sure that the result is robust. Yeah, I have two questions actually. One of the specific about this iridium O2. Okay. Uh, there is uh, many layered material of iridium, like iridium tellurium 2. Uh -huh. It's actually the same kind of triangular lattice and tellurium above and below. But in the iridium the tellurite, there is, uh, it doesn't remain actually a regular triangular, but there is a whole sequence of phase transition, this kind of formation of some superstructure. Did you okay. check actually uh, your material? I mean, we did. No, I mean, we what we did was check in lattice instability. So I think if there, but we didn't have a, a very fine mesh. But I think if there was some supercell commensurate with our, let's say, we, we checked this on a two 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 and on a three 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 grid. I think if there was any supercell commensurate with this, we would have seen it in the in the phonons. Basically, I mean, this would have shown up as a. As a phone on the But you mean in uh, like, like no, no, in plane. Uh, no, in like plane, I think, yeah. And so on, like that. No, in plane. In plane. No, then in plane superstructure, I think they would show up in the lattice dynamics, and mm -hmm. they didn't. So, yeah. And second general question, actually, as far as I understand, you use something like similar to Artyom Agana's program. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's uh, similar, yeah. But uh, for them, uh, 
that again, uh, you, you choose some particular composition, then you return to the structure and you put it. And well, what I know, actually, they can do it by simple idea, but they cannot really include credit you. So uh, do you have this problem, or it's possible now to kind of uh, overcome it? Because I mean, I it's, think uh, you can. Uh, uh, yeah. No, you can include. It's uh, formed uh, using simple LDA. Yeah. LDA, but not correlated system. So that's why right uh, they use I mean, that's what we do. We use it. It's the right way to do it. Because LDA plus U is not designed for. Maybe not LDA yeah. plus U, but somehow they have. All no, the what we do, we do GGA and, and then we. Methods to optimize structures. It's not just a gamma program, there's no yeah. methodology. Yeah. To do that. Yeah. Let me. But. Uh, so we use GGA, I mean, and then what we did, for example, in the BIS model was to recompute at the HSC level, but then you already have the structures busy, then, then you recompute uh, this thing, but in a second step. So not to do the, to do the full search, mm -hmm. uh, we don't do it. <laughs> but in the end, you're left with like a bunch of structures which are almost energized energetics, and on these you can do something better than, than pure LDA. Based. After you find the structure, then you can simply take this particular structure. No, no, we find, it. let's say you find a, a bunch of them, which is almost. <laughs> if you need it. Maybe you don't need it, but if you need it. OK. Yeah, if you need it, you can. I don't mean particularly either, but for example, some manganese oxide, some manganese oxide, whatever. Some manganese oxide, whatever. In which actually uh, you, sooner or later, you have to be fully connected. No, no, but here we did include correlation at some point for the for the electronic. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Basically, you find the right structure, but maybe then it would remain stable. This correlation is more included. Uh, I'm not sure. No, but here, I mean, what, yeah, okay. But here, let's say we put everything in, and then we check, for example, that it's dynamically stable, not thermodynamically. Mm -hmm. And in the other case, we recomputed the energies, and the energy ranking was correct. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you simply, it is, you didn't want to maybe root type of can be possible. Excuse me? The three-dimensional root, root, yeah. root type structure is yeah. possible in. Yeah, we found it. I mean, the, the, the ground state was the three-dimensional root tile, but then. I mean, if you compute the one with the lowest energy, you always find this. But then, together with this, you find a lot of other structures which are basically triangular-like and layered. And then we, we decided to take a look also at these. These have a higher energy than this. condition to be. No, no, we didn't uh, ensure. I mean, we weren't looking for any 2D structure, actually. We were looking just to construct this phase diagram, and we checked if this was correctly reproduced. It was reproduced, but then if you look at all the other structures that were produced, there were a lot of these triangular iridium lattices. And then we say it must be a very, very stable local minimum. And then we went to look, to zoom into this minimum, because we thought that this structure would be interesting to look at. And being very stable is also very likely, I mean, being very stable in the sense that you find it so many times, it's very likely that it would form. Can I make a comment on that? Because um, we were working with Raul Colea and Roger Johnson, who had, in fact, a dope systems where it's potassium, iridium, and oxygen. And uh, if you take the, if you just, uh, and they have various series of samples with different dopings of potassium. So on one, uh, on one uh, edge, you have the K2 iridium O3, which is a honeycomb lattice, where you have potassium in the middle and then potassium uh, interlayer, and then you have these planes. And now what happens is that you go and substitute it. So iridium and potassium seem to uh, very like uh, the same positions. So if you go now and reducing your potassium concentration, you start going from these honeycomb lattices to triangular lattices. And this is how we found also this state, although um, and now they are looking in fact and reducing. So okay. going into this limit by reducing the potassium concentration. This is how this state maybe could be stabilized. Yeah, that's very, that's yeah, the, that would be interesting to see. Just to that it seems that maybe you could stabilize the state. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the... That's what the, uh, yeah. 
So so probably the <coughs> oxide probably might be possible to stabilize in layers, uh, in yeah. the proper substrate. Exactly. Not probably in the bulk. Uh, no, no, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just to stabilize it in some particular substrate at uh, single, single thin films, for example. Yeah. That might be probably the way to go. Yeah. We should use proper substrate, <coughs> proper symmetry. Yeah. These two or three days, can you get uh, this uh, harmonic uh, honeycomb or uh, hyper honeycomb lattices? Uh, I have, we have to see. We have to see together. Yeah. So maybe some stupid test, but why sodium? I mean, you can choose more sodium, but why sodium? Because it's just. Plus. <laughs> Any. <What? laughs> I was just. Uh, Are you asking me? No, no, no. No, me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We have to start from something. I mean, yeah. Let's thank Lila and all the speakers. And we thank all the speakers.